Welcome to an edition of Vinyl Ventures that is a special episode for us. It's our 50th. 50 episodes, man. Our golden anniversary. Our golden anniversary. Did you ever think that when we were sitting in my front room, just the two of us for like those first three episodes that we recorded, that, that it was going to be something that we stuck with for 50 episodes? I had no idea. Yeah, it's, it's pretty insane. It, it's great to see all of the people that have like grabbed on from the beginning and stayed there. It's, it's really uh, shocking to me. Uh, we, we never did this to for any other reason other than because we love it. And to have fun. And to have fun. Yeah. And we've maintained that fun level. We maintained and increased that level of love and affection we have for it. And people, you know, people started listening from the beginning, and it's really been great. But the big one comes from you. Thank you yes. for listening, watching. Subscribing. Subscribing and continue to subscribe. Yeah. If you're listening to us and you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, please do. If you're watching us for the first time and you haven't subscribed, please do. And communicate with us on social media on Facebook is is where we communicate a lot with folks and Instagram. Uh, we we want to get discussions started. We want to hear what you guys want to see. We want to hear uh, ideas for shows from you guys. And we're going to try to stoke those fires a little and, and maybe do some um, – polls and some different things on on those social medias just to make it a little more interactive. Tell us a little bit about what we're doing today. So for our 50th, we wanted to do something a little bit different than we've done in the past. So we went on the road to the Crossroads Music Show. And we, we had a chance to sit down with some folks that we've talked to on the show before, uh, a couple that we haven't talked to on the show before. We did some What's in Your Bag segments. We were basically covering the entire show in only the way that we could do it. We had the entire backstage filled with all of our stuff. So, But let me tell you about the first person that we talked to at the show, and that was Rob Coyle. Rob Coyle is the originator of the Crossroads Music Show, and we had a chance to sit down with him and talk to him about how the vinyl landscape has changed over the last few years. And also, we talked to him about selling your entire collection all at once and then having the opportunity to collect all those records again. Rob, thanks yeah. for having us. Thanks yeah. for letting us invade most of the stage here. As we look out, it's almost 11 o'clock right now. Right. And before we got on camera, we were just talking about, this is about as busy as, since I've been coming to the show, about as busy as I've seen it at this yeah, time. Yeah, no, really good turnout. Um, yeah, really happy with, uh, especially after Record Store Day, I wondered how that would go and everything. Yeah. But it seems like everybody's out having a good time and finding some good records out there. Now, is is it an intentional thing to to schedule this show so closely to Record Store Day? Have you noticed? No, I wish I think uh, I wish that was my genius plan, but no. What it really comes down to is this is a busy venue. They do bingo, they do card shows, comic book shows, weddings. I mean, any kind of event goes on at this place. We're just lucky to get the dates we get. Honestly, yeah. I wanted a Saturday, and obviously, we know better than to schedule on a Saturday of Record Store Day. Yeah, I like Saturdays, but. It's just the way it happened this year. You know, this is not going to be a continuing thing because obviously I want these com customers to come in with as much money in their pockets as they can. <laughs> Coming back after record store day probably, you know, eh, is not, not. The, not the best time to hit you right. know, avid record collectors. But no, it seems to be working out pretty good. Basically, we were kind of tired of the other options we have, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, felt like we weren't really getting treated real well. And it was it was just time to expand. It was uh, The market was there and it was time for new blood to take over. So not Nine years ago, let's see if I can do the math. So that would have been 2012, 13. Yeah, yeah 12, 13, something like that. Yeah. So when you decided to, to start having this show here, what was the environment like compared to what it is now? Really, it hasn't changed. I mean, I noticed the age of the collectors constantly changing. We're getting younger and younger. And the things we used to sell even 10 years ago now, where I used to joke that, you know, rock and roll started with Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath, I'm not so sure rock and roll doesn't start with the Ramones and the Sex Pistols yeah. now. You know what I mean? We yeah. just keep going, you know. Or, yeah, ta so or Taylor the, Swift. That's true. <laughs> Taylor Swift, you know, and I know we're going to talk about her. You know, 75,000 copies. I mean, that's a testament to uh, her fans. And, you know, hey, that's cool to me. You know what I mean? Everybody's got to be into something. I know it's cool and hipsterish to be into punk and bands nobody's yep. ever heard of, but... 
good for her crowd. She's got them out. She's got them buying records. And if they're buying her records, they're buying other people's records. And it's just, uh, it's good for the whole hobby. You yeah. know, because these are going to be our long-term collectors. You know, these guys that are in their upper 60s, they probably got everything they want, you know. They're only looking for upgrade copies of anything at this point, yeah. you know. So we need that new blood to keep this hobby going. So, yeah, glad to have them. You well, know? well, having been at Record Store Day yesterday on the west side of Karma, um, all I heard in the background when I was 60th in line was Taylor Swift this. They yeah. don't have it here. They don't have it there. Yep. And, you know, even like five, six years ago, if you had told me that the best ambassador to vinyl records was gonna right. be was gonna be Taylor Swift yeah. I would have told you it's hard that, to believe over Henry Rollins and Alice Cooper yeah. and Eddie Vedder I mean we've had some great ambassadors you well, know Ozzy the, even the Ozzy was an ambassador the great thing about Taylor is it's it's the younger generation but it's also all the women this exactly. is exactly this has been a boys club for, you are exactly right and this is a demographic that I've been working on since I started this and they're not so worried about the rarest thing out there they, they like what they like and you know you can sell pop music, you know, which is great, mm -hmm. you know, because somebody's got to buy that stuff. So, yeah, but that's a demographic we've really been working on trying to get for a long time. So, you know, I think that's a good thing, too, with the future of collecting that we need to bring everybody here because music's for everybody after all. I mean, look at this. This is a, a beautiful sight here. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So one more thing I wanted to talk to you about. Um, all right. We This has happened since we had you on the show last time. So you basically had an offer about a year ago. Someone came in and bought your entire collection. Minus 500 that I kept. Minus 500 that you kept. <laughs> yeah, but minus, the, the, yeah. the special 500. I'm uh, sure a lot of special those, to me. You know, I'm sure was, a lot of those were Black Sabbath and Ozzy. A lot of them were Black Sabbath and Ozzy, <laughs> you know, and other things were uh, stupid things like, uh, well, not stupid, but, you know, Greek uh, psych record that my son bought me for a birthday present one time. You know, the car's yeah. greatest hits that my wife bought me for Christmas, yeah. you know. I mean, it was sentimental value, right. not like maybe worth hundreds of dollars, right. you know, that kind of thing. Well, so. uh, what I'm curious about is, okay. is basically these guys got a hold of you and they made you an offer that you couldn't resist yes what was since we you know we we had you on the show and we had a good discussion we're going to have you on the show again uh -huh. but emotionally and there's a lot of i i would think that there's a lot of emotions going on there when someone is. says hey i'm going to buy your entire collection i'm going to give you x amount of dollars Take us through that, because most of us don't have collections like that. Yeah, um, I will tell you this, that it is concrete, and I would have never expected to see what's happened as far as the prices of vinyl. And you know me, I am a picky SOB on condition. <laughs> I cannot replace near mint condition records. I mean, we were joking about the Slayer stuff. You know, I just right. picked up this collection Friday night, you know, and I've got a bit of it here with me, but I think I had three Slayer records, you know, I had all the Slayer records. They were mint. They yeah. were in the shrink. They had hype stickers. You name it. The music machine, the seeds. I mean, you just name the band and I had it and they were yeah. in perfect condition. I've tried to go back and get half these records yeah. and I'm like settling at VG Plus, which I don't settle for VG Plus. So I've <laughs> kind of come to the conclusion if they don't make an audiophile reissue of it, you know, like something from RTI or Palace or, you know, QRP or something. I really don't have to have it. I think mm -hmm. Spotify is doing just fine. But I have amassed another, I'd say the between here and New Mexico, the record collection is up to about four or 5,000 records again. Well, and, and what was it? I mean, it's one thing to let go of this whole huge collection that basically uh -huh. your life has been, You're been exactly built around. You're right, yeah. But it's got to be a lot of fun to have the opportunity to start your collection over. You know, and I thought it would be, but then, like I said, <laughs> the seller's remorse, it doesn't matter what the price tag I got out yeah. of it is, because now those same records, I mean, just, I, I, you name the band, and it's like, they went up double, triple, you know, if they're in nice condition from when I even sold them two years ago. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so a lot of that stuff, it's just like, okay, goodbye metal. You'll never come to my house again, you know, that kind of thing, you know. And it's just that the prices that they're going for, it'd be stupid not to sell it right, right now. Right. You know what I mean? That well, kind of thing, too. Uh, but the one thing that I've learned, that John and I have learned digging back into this, is you never know. Patience prevails. You never know what's going to pop yep. up. Yep. And, uh, yep. you know, you could you could end up with a collection that, that 
kind of fulfills all that stuff you got you could, rid of. You could, yeah. And that's but the right that, now. You better be lined up with a thousand dollar bills handy yeah, too, because yeah. nobody's giving this stuff away. But no, that's why I think the record shows are the best thing. You know, as far as collecting goes, because you come out here and you know I could go around the room and point them out. You know, you got Bob and Bill over here that would die if you brought in a box of Beatles records. They would absolutely die. Yeah. But if you brought in a box of ACDC, Motley Crue, they'd be like, ah, kid, I give you a dollar a piece. You yeah. know? Meanwhile, I'd be flipping over that right. kind of stuff. Right. You know, right. uh, 80s hair metal and uh, metal, yeah. you know, that'd be great by me, you know, that kind of thing. So what I've learned about record shows, which you don't have this at a store where they have all day to sit on discogs and figure out, you know, how they can get the top dollar ever out of stuff. Yeah. What you have at a store is you have a bunch of collectors that get rid of the other stuff so they can go buy more Beatles records. And they might not put, you know, the price on a Black Sabbath record that I might put on it because I cherish that band because that's their Beatles, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. So you yeah. kind of buy around... You know, the young guys you buy the old stuff off of, the old guys you buy the young stuff off yeah. of. You know, if that makes any sense. But I've been buying and selling for 25, almost 30 years now, you know, and that's exactly what I've always noticed. You buy your metal off the old Beatles and Elvis guys, and if you need, you know, which I still love the 60s. I yeah, still yeah. think that is just one of the late 60s was a revolutionary time for sound. Yep. It inspired everything from punk metal, you know, any, any kind of music that's out there comes from you know the 60s yep. you know that yep. kind of thing so i'm not dogging the 60s at all i just think as far as the collecting going it's always moving forward and you know we've got to be forward thinking or else it's just going to be a bunch of us sitting in a room trading Bolly, buddy holly records back and forth which buddy holly's great but taking light bulbs out of the <laughs> exactly <scene>. yeah <laughs> well rob we can't thank you enough for, right. for being such a great ambassador to, okay, to the records and for letting us invade your show today nice so. nice appreciate you guys coming out can you imagine selling your entire collection and then basically rebuilding the collection? Because I, he, he did. I can't. And um, one of the things that really stood out to me in that conversation was he he basically said there's no way that he can replace what he's gotten rid of because the prices just keep rising. And, and that just goes back to something that we talk about all the time. The, this is a phenomenon that apparently has no end. Yeah, and when you start talking about certain pressings, I mean, then the record doesn't become valuable, or at least the music and what's on the record, it's not the valuable part. It's the collectability of the piece of media. Right, and, and you know, pressings aren't something that we, like, dig deep into in this show. We've had a few people, and we'll talk to Michael Young later in the show about a few of those things, but uh, we're collectors from all spaces in, in the vinyl collecting community. A lot of people out there are that picky and that choosy. They, they want that original first press or original uh, you know press from Britain or whatever. And it, it kind of changes the, the whole experience when, when you collect that way. You know, Jay, I had a chance to sit down with Kit Heyman, who we had as a guest way back on Season 2, Episode 19. Kit has a vast musical background. He's like a, he's like a music savant. Yeah. He plays music. He collects music. He worked in a record store for Rob yeah, yeah. once he, upon a time. He collects guitars. He's, he's a multifaceted dude and has so much knowledge. His show is, uh, I hear from a lot of people, his show that we did with him is is one of their favorites. We had a chance to dive deeper into the local scene and when Indiana Avenue was raging with Kit, and here's what he had to say. Kit, you had a great take on some local jazz artists, sure. Scrapper Blackwell, and you've been getting more into uh, West Montgomery. Sure. Talk yeah. about that a little bit. Well, recently uh, would have been Wes's hundredth birthday, so they did a documentary on uh, it would have been on public television that was really good. Um, I was really pleased with it, and uh, I've always been into West Montgomery, but like here lately, just seeing some of these old uh, eight millimeter films that the families release and things like that has made it really cool. And uh, his brother played also. Yeah, Monk Montgomery. So. Uh, you know, there's not a lot known about Monk Montgomery, but he used to have this guitar player book from the 80s, and it was just interviews dating back to uh, journalists who documented guitar players and bass players. Uh, I mean, like one of them in there is Jimi Hendrix. There's an interview with Jimi Hendrix oh, wow. in this book. I gotta find it. I think it's still at my parents' house somewhere. But reading this book, there was an interview with Monk Montgomery. 
that was really cool. So I'm hoping one day somebody tells his story because it's really, really fascinating. And you've got a kind of a family connection. Well, and, and I'll never know this, but, you know, in the book, Monk Montgomery talked about working at this foundry in Indianapolis that ended up being the same foundry my great-grandpa worked at. <laughs> so I wish I could go back in time and ask my great-grandpa, hey, did you know Monk Montgomery or Wes Montgomery? Because he would have been working in Indianapolis in the same area they were from. So, but we'll never know. That whole Indiana Avenue was raging. Right. What, what were the years that it was really big? Um, you know, really, I mean, in the 40s and 50s, in the early 60s, you know what I mean? I mean, the music scene in Indiana has always been something. It's always been something special, whether it's, you know, the Montgomery Brothers coming from Indianapolis all the way up to John Mellencamp to me, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I find talent in all of them. I'm a big Mellencamp guy, too. So it's interesting. There's so many people from Indiana or that Indiana connection, you know what I mean? From the Zero Boys to Wes Montgomery to John Mellencamp. It's pretty cool. It's unique. That's for sure. It, it's pretty cool. I mean, it, it kind of flies under the radar. I mean, except for the big guys like Mellencamp, but right. everybody else kind of flies under the radar. Yeah. And another one is uh, Guitar Pete. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. If you no. like Scrapper Blackwell, which is just straight up more Delta style blues, um, Guitar Pete was also from Indianapolis and uh, he died pretty young of a heart attack. But uh, if you get to reading about him a little bit and listen to his record, it's really good. Let's go to the the punk side, the Zero sure. Boys, and oh, yeah. when that was raging. Talk about that a little bit. Well, I wasn't around those times. I know a lot of guys that were. Um, I kind of wish I would have grown up in those times, but I think Paul Mahern's a genius. Uh, he's produced some really good records, and not only that, I think the Zero Boys album, Vicious Circle, is just one of the absolute best punk records of all time. That's cool. And uh, also, you can't forget about the Jetsons. Another great punk band, the Gizmos. Another one is Dow Jones and the Industrials. Oh, Can't yeah. forget about those guys. I mean, all of that stuff is just... Like, that Hoosier Hysteria record right. is so good. I've got that. Yeah. So, like, anything that's related to Indiana, oh, as God. far as, like, punk, metal, blues, things like that, I'm really into. You know what I mean? Sloppy Seconds being another one. Oh, yeah. Another fantastic band from Indiana. And they were playing like mad in the patio and Vogue days. Oh, yeah, yeah. See, I wasn't around during those yeah. times either. But then it's cool to hear about bands like uh, Green Day coming through and playing ch gigs there and stuff yeah. like that. You know what I mean? So, yeah, there's a lot of rich history here. Yeah, and we're right across the street from uh, what used to be Birdies. Right. I used to play there a little bit. Oh, did you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah good times. Yeah, and there were some legendary, I mean, Prince even did uh, like yeah, a special show there. That Prince, um, you know, I'd heard Towns Van Zandt, Richie Havens, different people in the 80s had played that spot. Um, you know, it, it's kind of a piece of history, but, you know, things change, you know, and venues, it's harder for venues to maintain that, you know what I mean? And it's just hard for venues to survive the, these times in this economy and climate, you know what I mean? So besides Indiana stuff, what are what's I know you like some country stuff. What oh, are you yeah. kind of looking for at shows? Always looking for uh, as far as country music, uh, a lot of t anything. Well, anything right now, I'm always looking for anything Dolly Parton or Black Flag or Germs, things like that. What's harder to find? Most definitely Black Flag and Germs. Anything SST. I love uh, Loretta Lynn albums things like that i'm also looking for loretta lynn's 45 on zero anything on the zero label if anybody out there has loretta lynn records on zero label please give me a shout out or a call do you find i've always wondered this do you find that like uh regions because i know you travel a bunch do you find yeah. like in the maybe like around memphis is there more country in nashville and memphis not not really but i'll tell you what kentucky has the most diverse taste in music. Every time I had traveled to Kentucky, I had either find a Johnny Thunders album at a flea market. I found a copy of Black Flag Damage at oh. a flea market ba back when I was a kid. Uh, Blink-22 Cheshire Cat on cassette tape. But then you would turn around and find, uh, I found the Moving Sidewalks, which is Billy Gibbons' first band on 45. Oh, wow. Down at uh, Goodwill in Kentucky years ago. So you just, like, Kentucky has been kind of one of those places that's like, wow, of diverse taste in music. I, I don't understand. It goes for everything from bluegrass to punk. 
That's wild. Yeah. So you, you don't expect it. And no. And then my family on my mom's side being from Kentucky, you know, I was always traveling down there and listening to bluegrass music, but like people down there that enjoy the bluegrass music, they thought it was cool that I was wearing a Ramones t-shirt, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I got along with people down there, you know, wearing a Ramones t-shirt back in the day when I was a teenager was kind of like an outcast sort of thing here. But like down in Kentucky, I was accepted and they're like, oh yeah, I saw the Ramones in Covington, Kentucky in 1981. You know, people would come up to me and tell me stories. That's a trip. Yeah. So it's, you know, you wouldn't think all the way down yeah. there in Kentucky that people would be into that. But every time I've been down there, you know, someone's got a really cool story. It's, it's wild to go to different cities and see the music scene sure. that's brewing. And it was cool because one time I went way down there in Kentucky in Danville and Danville, Kentucky, and Bob Mould was playing a show, and I saw a flyer for it, and I was just probably 13, and I was like, holy crap, like, Bob Mould's playing here, and my dad's like, who? Who? I'm like, Bob Mould. You don't know who Bob Mould is? I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. You know what I mean? Like, in the most random place, you yeah. know? There, there's so much music out yeah. there. It's so much fun to go to and, different record stores. And sorry that I go all over the place because I just love music, and my mind goes 100 miles a minute just thinking about different bands, different music, and records. But, uh, yeah, we're here today at the Crossroads Music Show where I'm probably going to go broke yeah. as normal. Um, I bet you experience that a lot and have to explain to my wife that um, – you know, we'll have to wait off on holding the bill, uh, paying the bills till next month. <laughs> but uh, no, it's we have a good time out here. What's the best record you found at Crossroads? Oh gosh! And these are just anybody can wow. come in and buy them. I know you got some really good 45s from Doug. I think the absolute best record I've ever found. It would have to be a toss-up between the Minor Threat seven inch, or it would probably have to be Teen Idol seven inch Minor Disturbance on uh, Discord. Yeah. That that was probably one of the rarest. But I think, hands down, I think years ago, I found uh, Misfits, I Die My Darling, on Purple Vinyl here. That guy doesn't set up here anymore. I haven't seen him in years. But yeah, I did. I think I did find that here. So that that was probably the rarest. Yeah, and Discord's still pressing records out yeah, of D.C., absolutely. which is amazing. And uh, you get yeah. some of that old back catalog. But I mean, it's cool to find the originals. Like, just out here today, if you're a punk guy, they got the Stooges Fun House, original pressing, sitting right out here. Um, this is something you don't see at every record show. Just in the room, I saw someone buy Legacy of Brutality on Plan 9. Cool stuff. I mean, every time I know there's going to be something in the room that I like. And it's cool to see everybody buying this stuff, too. So Yeah, there's a, there's a little bit of something for everyone. Yeah, most definitely. No, I love coming out here. This is probably our, we're going to go on our 10th year. I believe this is probably year number 10. I've been here since the beginning with Rob. I used to work for him at his record store way back in the day in Shelbyville, Indiana. So it's cool to see this thing grow. What was an idea that we thought would never happen, it's cool to see it actually happen. 10 years. That's a long time for anything to go on. And to have a record show that they've seen nothing but growth from, that's incredible. Yeah, so it would have been 2013. 2014 when they did their first one and if you think back that's really when you and I kind of started doing this too just to see the amount of growth in the show since we've been going it, it's pretty impressive yeah it, it's really impressive and I mean I think Kit touched on a bunch of stuff that you can find anything you're looking for at these and that's that's one of the great things with we, we still want you to go to local record stores but record shows are a great opportunity to find stuff that you wouldn't be looking for. There's highly collectible records mm -hmm. and some very common records. So you might find Billy Joel and you might find a $2,000 jazz record you've been looking for. That's what I love about the shows is that they're, it's not just a collection of music. It's a collection of people bringing music from different parts of the country and different parts of the region. And basically bringing them to your doorstep and all you have to do is come in there and spend some money and get a record that you maybe otherwise wouldn't be able to. The collection of people is really what makes this show tick. Who did you talk with next? I had the opportunity to sit down with Shane Hiles. Shane runs Astral Records and we just had a nice conversation with him about where the vinyl industry has been and where he thinks it's going. 
tell us a little about how the Crossroads Music Show has been going today. You know, you bring things to these shows, and sometimes you you like, oh, that's going to be the first thing that sells, and it's never like some like people, like I don't know, you never know. I you mean, can, you can't predict any of this, right? Right. So what I do is, if you look, I put some records that I feel like are things that people are going to really want, yeah. like up on the back of my boxes, yep. and. That's eye candy to draw people. <laughs> right. And you always think those are going to be the ones that sell, but sometimes they aren't. So well, even if they're the ones that just are like magnetizing people and sure, bring them yeah, in, yeah, that's great. So when we talked to you last, we were at a record show in Louisville. Yep. It was about two years ago. Yep. Right in the throes of COVID. Oh yeah, it was a weird time. What has changed? Not just from your business perspective and Astral Records, mm-hmm. but even as a collector yourself, what have you seen changing since then? The amount of shows and like even people like doing more and more shows. Like the, there's some guys that are set up back here from the Dayton area. They're starting, their, they're doing their first show in two weeks. Oh, okay. So they're like, there's gra- grassroots efforts coming up to do more record conventions and more shows. I've been involved in more shows that aren't traditional record shows, so more along the lines of like a brewery that is interested in having a vinyl night, you know, or something like that. There's been a lot of that. And then, of course, I'm, I'm sure as you know, with like record, record Store Day was yesterday, but the amount of pressings that are happening is insane. It's wild. Yeah. The distributor I use regularly, I can't even, if I had hours to spend just to look at the things that are coming out or that are available for pre-order, I don't have enough time Mm-mm. in my life to do it. Mm-mm. It's wild. For RSD yesterday, there was one thing I wanted. I got there, I got what I wanted, and then I started looking at the PDF of just all the other RSD releases, Uh and my eyes started spinning. And I'm like, (laughs) that's enough. I don't don't need any more. So uh, what, for you personally as a collector, has been different since COVID? It's interesting, like, personally as a collector, the things that I'm most interested in are, like, a lot of record labels are finally starting to come around. Yeah. You know, like... And listen to people. Yeah, I'm going to throw out a record store date. Like, I'm a big Dead Milkman fan and have been since I was a kid. And the only album I never had was Metaphysical Graffiti. And they did that last year for Record Store Day. And I was really happy with that. And it just seems like the things that tick my boxes yeah are coming out more and more yeah and i'm really happy about that i'm happy about that too it 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 seems like for the first 10 years of of this wave that has been going it seems like there were some odd choices like there were some odd things that they were pressing and it's almost like they're reading the minds of middle-aged dudes like me and you now (laughs) you know yeah it took a little while for i think record labels um especially the big labels you know, they're interested in pushing the stuff that's hot on the radio. And it's it's going to take as long, basically what you said, as long as this wave's been going for them to realize, hey, this is kind of a real thing now. Yeah. And we need to look at our back catalog and see what people are paying 300 bucks for on eBay. Right. You know? Right. And then maybe press some of those. <laughs> yeah. And it seems like it's happening. You have kids. Yeah. Are, are they getting in, involved in vinyl anymore? My, my youngest is nine Mm -hmm. and he's just more interested in games minecraft and legos and stuff like that he doesn't i mean maybe when he's a teenager my daughter is somewhat interested in it but she has airpods glued into her ears Mm. you can't can't get a word in edgewise so she's listening to vinyl ventures yes all the time of course yeah (laughs) Because <laughs> she wants to know what the middle-aged no, dudes she, are doing. She, yeah, she has maybe, you know, 30, 40 records. And yeah. I, did, I did hook her up with a turntable. And every now and then I'll hear her, you know, playing something like that. But she's got her very... She's actually helped with my store some. We've talked before the camera came on. And you were talking about how there's younger people and there's more women coming to these shows than we've ever noticed. Yeah. You know, I got a 15-year-old daughter, and she's saying, this is hot, this is hot, this is hot, and I'm buying that stuff, and it's translating into sales. Isn't that amazing? So, you, yeah. you you know, you're basically making your uh, daughter do all of your selling work for you. <laughs> it's not just that. I make her do the physical work, too. <laughs> <laughs> Help Dad load this up. She cleans the records, and she can she can lift some boxes. I, I put her in, yeah, I put her to work. You so. know, that's a good work ethic to instill yeah, in, yeah. in kids nowadays. Now, I know that we talked to you about this when you're... You were on the show before and I want to I want you to get that crystal ball out again that okay. you can't see anything in but we still ask you about it <laughs> what do you think is is happening here because I look at a show like this and I John and I always talk about man this just keeps this just keeps going up yeah 
I got an interesting theory. Mm-hmm. And you know how I am with my theories. I love hearing you, your if theories. You, if you go back and listen to my my episode that we did together, to me, I think there's it has to do with the actual audio equipment sales. Mm-hmm. Like, I think if a person spends, uh, I'm just going to throw out an arbitrary number. Mm-hmm. If someone spends a thousand bucks on a turntable, mm-hmm. they're invested. You oh, know, absolutely, they're invested in it. Yeah. And, I know from watching some YouTube channels and some of the, because I'm an audio, like I I follow the audiophile stuff, right? that companies like Project, Riga, companies that make turntables are selling $1,000 plus turntables in unbelievable numbers, unbelievable numbers. And to me, if you invest money in that and you start getting into it a little bit, it doesn't even have to be a $1,000 turntable, but if you've gone out and gone out of your way to buy a $300 Audio Technica turntable and you've got speakers hooked up and you've done all that, you're probably going to stick with that for a while, you know? Yeah. And the numbers of people, it's just the numbers don't lie, basically. It's just, it just seems to be like the bubble's not going to pop. It's just like a, a lifestyle change overall. Yeah. So Well, that's one side of the industry that I think a lot of us forget about because some of us either kept those turntables and that equipment from when we were collecting before yeah. or bought stuff way earlier. I mean, right. you know, 10, 12 years ago, it wasn't easy. You didn't have a wide variety of, yep. of equipment to choose yep. from. So that's a good point. And it's, it, I, I think that's a side of the industry that we just forget about most yeah. of the time. Yeah. I feel like if, you know, there's some of this happening too, but if a kid goes and their parents buy him a Crosley or something from mm-hmm. I don't know, wherever, Target, and they buy a couple records and it's just kind of a thing, that's probably a temporary thing. Mm-hmm. You know, that's probably like, oh, it's funny. You know, they listen to the records sometimes here and there. They're not going to be the kind of people to come to a show like this. Right. But if you invest a little bit of money in that and you've, you know, put forth the effort to learn about it, mm-hmm. yeah, I think that's somebody that's going to be a collector for a number of years. So, and like you said, we're seeing younger people and more diverse crowd. I just, I don't see an end in sight for a while. Shane, tell us about where people can go and look up what you're selling and what okay. you have. Yeah, my, um, Astral Records. I'm based out of Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, I don't really have a website. I just sell at conventions. I do 20 to 30 a year. I do have an Instagram. It's, um, I don't even know what it is. What, something Wax. At, no, I have or, two. Oh, oh, okay. So there's one where I'm spin- I'm still doing that. He's spinning his, his collection uh, A to Z. A to Z, every record. We're in the O's. Oh, my gosh. I'm busting into the Aussie box set. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> and uh, the, But then that's that's called Drastic Plastics, mm-hmm. at Drastic Plastics on Instagram. And then I think my Instagram hand, I should know this. This is terrible. It's at Astral Records Louisville, I think. Okay. And then I'm on Facebook, too. Okay. I do unboxing videos almost every week. Awesome. And I'm starting to get traction with that, too. Yeah. Like people are coming and saying, hey, do you have this? I saw it on your video. Yeah. And then I, what I always say, because I'm such a salesman, I'm like, hey, I ship daily. If you see something on there. <laughs> Just send, send him a message. <laughs> send and... me a message. I'll, I'll ship it to you. <laughs> Shane, thanks so much. Yeah, for, man, absolutely. It's, yeah. Thanks for taking the time. And yeah. uh, we wish you nothing but, but great success yeah, moving forward. Yeah, me too. Same to you guys. That was a fantastic conversation with Shane. He He's so knowledgeable about so many different aspects of, of vinyl collecting. And the one thing that we don't talk about a lot on this show is equipment. Yeah, we need to dive into that pool because Shane always comes at us with these interesting uh, theories. And like takes. He, and takes, yeah. like his take on uh, Japanese pressings right, when he right, was on the show. Right. And now this one, it's like... Ooh, that's I didn't even think of it that way. But he is he's deep in selling records, so he's got to think about it in a different way that we don't. Yeah, and that's another great thing about these shows is you you get the the different records and and different items that these guys bring together to one place, but you get all of these different takes and these different attitudes and thoughts about what's going on in the vinyl world. Yeah, and used equipment guys are starting to pop up more at the shows. Yeah, yeah. So there's a little bit of something there for everyone. Absolutely. The One of the interesting guys at all of these shows that we've never had a chance to sit down and talk to, you finally grabbed at the Crossroads Music Show. That was uh, Duke Buttram. And Duke is this guy that I think the first show I was ever at, Duke was there. Yeah. Duke was there with his wife selling records, and uh, he just 
gotten into the game at that point. And he's always got a great big setup there at the show, at least two tables, usually three. And his his the quality of his records is always top notch. Yeah, and Duke told me one time, hey, if it's if it's a ratty record, I just take it to Goodwill. Yeah. He he goes through every single record, checks them out, and if they're not good quality, he just gets rid of them. That's that's uh, always a great guy to buy from. It absolutely is. And uh, Duke, since we had never really talked with Duke on a show. I dove a little more into Duke's background and how he got into this crazy game. We're here with Duke, and Duke, you've been in selling records since 2014? Correct. And you got in after you retired, so. But you were always in vinyl. Talk about your, your background. Well, I grew up around music. My dad was a, a music guy, he played music back in the 60s. Um, played country music, actually but cut a record and you know he was a minor star back in the day so I was always around music um, got my first guitar when I was about 12 and he kind of taught me how to play the chords and been in a few bands over the years and my last band was a bluegrass band but uh, that was back in the 80s but anyway in the vinyl I've always been in, around music and buying vinyl uh, graduated high school in the 70s so all the rock bands I had all that vinyl back in the day so uh, we actually got into it. Uh, we retired, my wife and I, Karen, from our jobs in 2013, and a uh, neighbor across the street had some, a lot of vinyl he wanted to get rid of, and I took it all and started looking it up, and it just kind of evolved from there. So, And we've been doing this for almost 10 years now. So I'm kind of a rookie, most of these guys here, but uh, it's a lot of fun. You always have a great collection of records. Mm -hmm. Where do you where do you wind up finding your records? Well, a lot of records. We we travel January, February. We like to go somewhere warm. Uh, Arizona. We went last year, and we'll put an ad in the paper, uh, say an out of town record buyer looking for records, and we'll just get calls, uh, lots of calls. Really? And, and uh, we flew out to Arizona last year, and uh, I had to ship about forty boxes back because we flew, and. Uh, but it's just amazing the calls you get when you put an ad. People, oh yeah, I've got some records in the closet, or I've got them in the basement. They're just collecting dust. And, and uh, well, yeah, that's probably good in a newspaper because you get people who have these huge collections and they're still mm -hmm. reading newspapers. So right, they are. Yeah, that and we we go to Florida as well. And Florida's a pretty hot spot too for records. I bought a nice, huge jazz collection from a collector down there, and it was really nice. It was it was a good find. Do you remember the first record you ever bought as a kid? I think the first record I might have bought was, um, it might have been a Grand Funk Railroad album, like in 69. Yeah. Uh, uh, that might have been the first, because I was a big Grand Funk fan. But, were you uh, were you on the Beatles train at all? Well, I have an older sister, and... Okay, she, she was your sensei. Exactly. <laughs> So she had all the Beatles stuff, okay. and yeah, I, I got into the Beatles, and they're probably my favorite group, so yeah, uh, listen to a lot of Beatles, uh, play a lot of music on my guitar, Beatles stuff, so yeah, yeah big Beatles fan. Now, didn't you tell me a story, you bought a Beatles ticket? It was an Elvis. Elvis, Elvis, yeah. that's right, that's right. When they ripped the tickets apart yeah. in half, and I bought the other half of the guy's ticket stub from the last concert in Indianapolis, and... Uh, which is pretty cool. You yeah. just don't see those anymore, hardly. Uh, hell, they're selling now for you know, thousands of dollars, some of them. But yeah, that was a pretty good find. Now, um, your, your dad playing country, did you grow up in the Indianapolis area? I did. We grew up on the east side, went to Tech High School. So uh, he played in all the bars. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was harder to do in those days. Yeah, it was... Uh, it was a lot of fun. I used to go in and watch him play. I mean, I was underage, but and he'd get me up on stage and do a few yeah. songs as well. And, oh, there's, there's a kid up there doing something. So, <laughs> But he had a drummer who was a lot younger than all the rest of the guys, so he was pretty cool, and him and I bonded a lot. So That's neat. That's yeah. neat. So music was really in your family from mm -hmm. the get-go. Yeah, for sure. What else did your, uh, did your sister kind of turn you on to? She turned me on to... Just the 60s psych stuff, like the zombies oh, and yeah. the Yardbirds and, you know, stuff like that. And uh, she had all that stuff. She, I remember her buying her first stereo. She was so excited. And, and uh, of 
course, I used to go in there and listen to all of her records when she wasn't home. So. Uh, oh yeah. But yeah, she had a, she had a nice, pretty nice collection. Donovan, you know, some of the folk stuff. Oh Dil- yeah. Dylan, things like that. It's funny. We we talked to some other folks your age and. Donovan was a big deal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was. I remember that song. Well, everybody, Mellow Yellow was big. Yeah, hit. I mean, I must have listened to that a thousand times, and uh, I thought that was pretty cool back in the day. So. But yeah, the the marketing with him was a little bit different than the marketing with like a, a band like the Beatles. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, he was what they call him, like the Dylan of yeah. the UK or whatever. Or, or, yeah. But he, yeah, he was pretty good. In your personal collection, your stuff, you have everything from today on back to the 50s. Mm-hmm. So in your personal collection, what do you wind up hanging on to and getting rid of? Well, I, of course I have all the Beatles stuff. Yeah. And the 70s rock. Uh, I was like uh, Grand Funk in Kansas and Rush, all those bands. You know, I, I have all those for sure. And then I, some of the 60s stuff my sisters have. You know, I have a lot of Yardbirds and Hollies and things like that so it's just and I, I don't know what I'm going to do with them all because I think <laughs> when my wife and I die our kids are just going to give them all away so <laughs> so uh, and I'll end up selling out of it if somebody wants something and I don't have it I'll, I'll sell it to them I'll find another one later that's, yeah. my, that's my thought process so yeah I have a nice system you know I went old school on my stereo system big floor speakers and the Marantz turntable and the, oh yeah and uh, the receiver so you know I work well, in the garage and I can just crank it up and do do what I do. So And that's a part of the business that we don't typically talk about that much, but the equipment side has really taken off. Mm-hmm. I mean it used to be those things were at yard sales for five bucks. Right. Now, you know, they're two hundred. Right. Yeah, the 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 old the old pioneer JBLs and all that stuff is really going for money. I, the guy in Fort Wayne is at the show, Brian, and you know he repairs and refurbs all that stuff. He said he just can't keep it in stock when he gets stuff like that. It just flies that's, off his shelf. That's amazing. And I, I mean, who would have? I would have never thought to see that one coming. Right. Yeah. Same here. But it's, I don't know. It's, it just sounds great. I mean, just you put the put the album on and just listen to it. Those those two amplifiers have a different presence mm-hmm. they kind of fill a room yeah. it's very warm mm-hmm. exactly exactly is there is there one piece of vinyl that you don't have that you would love to find <sighs> you know i can't think of one off the top of my head i'm sure there is um, but i think i've pretty much gotten everything that i'm i've looked for and if i if, if i don't have it now i had it at one time so. yeah uh, of course, the Beatles Butcher album, you know, everybody has a copy yeah. of that or everybody wants a copy of yeah. it. So, stuff like that. Some of the old indie uh, 70s bands like McKay and uh, Primeval and Zerfus, all those. those oh, are, yeah. Those are all stuff staples. That you, you don't hear about. Right. Yeah. Every once in a while, you'll come across some of those and you're going, oh, hello. And That's cool. With the uh, Now, do you find different kinds of collections in the West, like in Arizona, than here in the Midwest? Out in Arizona, we, we saw a lot more rock than we did here. Uh, it's down in Florida, you see a lot of, uh, <laughs> frankly, a lot of big bands, swing, things like that. Yeah. The older people down yeah, there. Yeah, just but, because of the age of the yeah, population. Exactly. But I, we, we had some good finds in Arizona as well. A lot of the 60s, 70s rock and some of the 80s. And, you know, they were re-releasing all this stuff again, too. So that kind of brings things to the forefront again. And, that's awesome. Thanks for talking with us. Hey, you're welcome. I appreciate you show. having me. Thank you. Nice to see you guys. What a great conversation that was with Duke. I mean, sometimes the stars don't align with schedules and how busy that that we are and these guys are, but I'm glad that we had all of these guys in one place to kind of pull from and, and sit down and talk with them. Yeah, it was great for for us to be able to grab them and not take a bunch of their time. And uh, yeah, because they got to they got to sell the records. They got to sell the records, but <laughs> they, they were able to share some important stories we've been wanting to tell for a long time. Yeah, and speaking of another guy that we've wanted to talk to for a long time, that would be Mike Crowder. Tell me a little bit about Mike. Mike, Mike goes way back. Mike was, uh, and we're going to hear from Mike. I'm not going to give away the whole story, but in the uh, in the 80s, Mike was at Karma on the South Side. Yeah. And uh, 
that karma location was the South Side's mecca for records. Right, right. And uh, he was in, he got to see so many legendary shows in the Broad Ripple area. I, I mean, there, there's not much to say. And he also did a lot of uh, meet and greets with a lot of these bands at that location, too. So yeah. Mike, Mike is just a wealth of knowledge. And he still has a ton of music connections. Mike, you were fortunate enough to be on the ground floor of, uh, I guess, the post-punk punk scene when it first started. Yes. Um, as a kid, buying records, I was probably like most people. I, I remember my dad getting the Columbia House ads from the Sunday paper, and he would kind of let me, all right, kid, you can tack one on. <laughs> and these albums weren't exciting. It would, I, I remember getting Golden Biscuits by Three Dog Night. <laughs> But one of them uh, he let me he let me get was was Paul McCartney and Wings, and I don't know why Wings kind of led me to the Beatles, and I was at that age where I discovered the first British wave and the second British wave simultaneously, and to some people they were really almost divergent forces. You know, punk was like we're going to put all that '60s stuff yeah. to bed we're the new sound, we're, we don't like hippies. But to me, it was just exciting, good music. You know, like I, I got as excited about The Who and The Kinks as I did as The Sex Pistols and The Clash. So my foray into that was that I had a musical father who was into country and bluegrass and really had really good taste, allowing me to buy some records through the Columbia House and then eventually looking at Zare ads in the Sunday Star, you know, <laughs> not even a record store, and, and like, oh, Kiss Alive, I, I, I saw ads for that Kiss band, they look interesting. <laughs> so I hope that's not throwing too much at you, but a lot of stuff happened very quickly, like in the mid-70s for me, and then, like I said, it just seemed like the 60s and, and 70s kind of music that was going on at the time led directly to punk, and I don't know what to tell you other than the first couple of ads I saw were very exciting. You know, maybe seeing the Sex Pistols on TV for the first time was, this is new, and this is interesting, and this is irreverent. So just fortuitous to be young at that age and have a, a father who supported my budding habit. Yeah, so your dad, was he really your musical sensei kind of? He, he was, because when I was a kid, I... You take these things for granted because you six, seven, eight years old. Every Saturday and Sunday morning, my dad would have music playing. He also played. He was a picker, as he would say. Couldn't read music, but he could hear something and just start instantly playing amazing guitar. So I always had early country and bluegrass stuff playing. And I didn't realize how fortunate I was to hear the Stanley Brothers to hear Bill Monroe, but also stuff like uh, Buck Owens and the Buckaroos, oh, yeah. George Jones. And if you think about the Buckaroos, like that leads you into things like you hear Creedence Clearwater. Well, that was something my dad and I both liked. Now, my dad wasn't a rock and roller, but he liked that Creedence. <laughs> I, like that, yeah. I like I that, I like that Creedence. <laughs> so, you know, you'd hear looking out my back door on my radio and he would go, I like that. Well, I like George Jones and I like Buck Owens and I like Johnny Cash. So I, I can't say that I discovered all this on my own. I had a very cool father who was a musically inclined dad that would encourage, he, he basically like, save up your money, get a paper route, come clean that my parents owned a Dairy Queen. So my first job was cleaning the parking lot. <laughs> And I would sit there, and in my mind, I'm like, if I do this all week, I can afford two albums this week. And that's how it started. And my dad had no problem feeding uh, that desire, feeding that, that fostering that, that habit at a young age. So, yeah, I, again, I'm very fortunate. Now, you sell records. Do you ever scratch your head about the value of, uh, of records? But... Columbia House Records, those records we used to get six for a penny? For, for a penny, yeah. <laughs> of course, we had that obligation to buy six more, and we couldn't enforce a contract with a minor, but that's we're splitting hairs at that point, right? <laughs> I do, and 
I don't scratch my head. I bump my head. Yeah. I run it into to hard objects just thinking about how accessible, how cheap, and again, just how lucky. I, I'm showing my age. I was a kid in the 70s, so I, I feel, I'm not, I'm not trying to be nostalgic, but just how fortunate I was that I could get all of those records and owe such a little amount of money. Yeah, because we could go to shows for 10 bucks. Oh, you start getting into concerts. I mean, the first arena rock show I went to, I, I'm an only child, but I had uh, my cousin lived a block away. He was three years older, which was perfect. He, you he know, had somebody to drive. Somebody <laughs> to drive. And I, I remember he would, you know, save your money. Blue Oyster Cult, Sticks and Stars are playing Market Square Arena. Sammy Terry was the MC. <laughs> if you remember, for those who don't know, Sammy Terry was uh, had a horror. It would show horror movies late on Friday night on Channel 4, which was our independent station. And Sammy was every young, at least young boy's hero. Oh, yeah. He was he was a star within himself, so he was almost like a fourth guest on on that bill, and that was my first concert. I think it was seven dollars. It might have even been as, as cheap as six fifty, but that was affordable. And I saw Blue Oyster Cult when they had their laser show, and it was the Agents of Fortune tour. I remember because <laughs> Don't Fear the Reaper was all over yeah. the radio, and. I enjoyed it so much, I was like, when's the next one? And you learn as a kid then that the arts and entertainment or the Let's Go section in the Indianapolis Star would have the concert ads every Sunday. If you remember those, it would be that the, they would introduce who was coming next. And I couldn't wait to Sunday mornings because my, you know, my dad would be looking at the sports section, my mom the front page, but I would get the Let's Go section and go right to the concerts. Oh, look, Aerosmith's coming. Oh, look, Kiss is coming. Yeah, because there was no internet in those days. You had no to get internet. it from the paper. Yeah, in TV, I mean, I do remember advertisements for concerts, but they were kind of few and far between. And it's the weird stuff. Like, I remember a, a Parliament Funkadelic ad, you know, because you're like, what is this? And you're like, wow, this is the soul funk version of Kiss. Yeah. You know, and how exciting it was, but... For some reason, I remember a Triumph ad, probably because uh, Brownsville Station was opening, and I really oh, liked yeah. them. But the blinding light show, Triumph, and you know, you'd see flash pots going off, and they'd have this great 10-second clip. But there, that was few and far between, if you remember. It yeah. was generally radio ads and the, the advertisements from the star on Sunday. So that piqued my interest into going to concerts. They were affordable. They were fun. And again, as the music changed, my interest in going to concerts changed. But everything, you wanted to go see Led Zeppelin, it was $10. You know, you wanted to go see the Rolling Stones, maybe that one was the first, I think it's the first concert I remember being $12. They played Louisville in 1981, and you're like, wow, it's $12. What's <laughs> going on with concerts these days? So the same thing. Everything was not only accessible, but things were affordable. Music yeah. was affordable back then. There weren't gold circles. There wasn't a VIP this or that. And, you know, I, dare I take a sheet, cheap shot at Ticketmaster while they're reeling. But if you remember the service charge back then was if you got your tickets at Ross and Babcock or Karma, it was a quarter. Yeah. They were hand-printed tickets. Yeah. And it's like... Ooh, it's seven and a quarter instead of seven. And, well, okay, but it's going to cost us a quarter in gas to go to the box office and get them. So now you have the service charge on a ticket can be $50 or more. Yeah. Not the ticket itself, the actual service charge. So I, I, I'm not trying to be nostalgic. I'm just I'm appreciative of how affordable concert going and music buying in general was back then. You were able to see a bunch of up-and-coming bands that are now now older bands, but in the early 80s at places like Third Base and the Patio. Okay, so the statute of limitations is up on all this stuff. I yeah. Think. So back then, being a teenager, this was before laminated IDs and driver's licenses, and it was before the crackdown that we have now, for better or worse, and I was able to see some of these bands and a band like R.E.M. on the Murmur Tour with the replacements opening, by the way. That show was $4. 
and it was right before my 21st birthday, but I knew I could get in. I had ID, as they say. Yeah. You know, you could doctor your ID. Some of the places didn't card. Again, I'm not, I'm not advocating for underage drinking or anything. I was there to see the bands, and it, it was easy enough that I could sneak my way into these places. The third base, you know, to see Dow Jones and the Industrials and all this crazy, again, this crazy new music like Dow Jones and the Gizmos and, and buying Hoosier Hysteria and those early Gizmos EPs at, at Second Time Around and Broad Ripple. And to be able to see this stuff live was like not only is this weird music going on i can see it it's affordable and i could get into the club yeah you know if if i told you how many shows i saw between the ages of 17 and 20 at places like the vogue and the patio and the third base it's an alarming number yeah and then also by then i was working at karma records when i was in high school and we could get on the guest list for a lot of those shows so then the doorman would get to know you, like, oh, yes, it's Mike and Gary from Karma Greenwood. <laughs> Let them in. And I, I really shouldn't be saying this stuff, but it's 40 years after the fact. And <laughs> You're I okay. I think I'm okay. <laughs> so, yeah, again, just being at the right place at the right time and meeting people that said, yeah, here's how you, I'll help you with your ID. and You can get into the third place, and here's the doorman's name, and, you know, just be friendly and... It was a great experience to see bands who became big bands. I mean, and yeah. you were at some of these shows, even the non-club shows, you can say, hey, I saw Metallica when they were an opening band, or I saw U2 open for Jay Giles. Yeah, band. exactly. You know, go, we got to see U2, I don't know if you were at that show, but I got to see U2 at Bogarts in Cincinnati when Boy came, first came out. Oh, they I... were a new band, you know, and you're like, oh, this is kind of interesting, let's go see these guys. And yeah, it was. I got to see a lot of bands before they broke big, some headlining small places, some as opening acts. So it was, again, a good time to be young and a lot of good new music that was very accessible. I'm going to keep saying, I know I'm being repetitive, but just how accessible it was. That's awesome. Well, Mike, thanks for talking with us. Thank you, John. And it's reliving cool. some of the. the I don't want to say better times, but more fortunate times. Just fortunate times. Affordable times. Affordable times. I like that. I'm so happy I finally got to talk with Mike. I know he, he doesn't love the camera, and I've been bugging him and bugging him. So to finally have a chance to sit down and really go back and talk about some of those glory days was awesome. Uh, What you guys don't know is that we've been on... Crowder to be on the show for three years, four years. Every time we go to a music show and we see him. Yeah. (laughs) And so we really have to give a a lot of thanks to Mike for sitting down with us. But I also want to thank Wheels because he he was on Mike for most of that show. And and then uh, it was toward the end of the show that we we got him up there. So it was great to talk to him. Great info. Oh, yeah. And uh, we could fill up five shows with Mike, couldn't we? Yeah. Once you wind him up, he just goes and goes and goes. Yeah. Speaking of people that I'm really glad we grabbed, Michael Young, episode 10 was Michael's episode. And that was really the first time on Vinyl Ventures that we sat down with somebody and dug deep into those minute details about pressings and, and things like that. It was a lot of fun to sit down with Michael. Michael definitely plays in a different atmosphere than we do. And yeah. he knows he knows so much. I mean, he had a background in radio, so Michael knows a lot about music and he even has a, a mono cartridge for his record player. Yeah, he's, he's one of those guys. And, and Michael is a great guy to talk to if you really want to dig down into those details about pressings and, and different details that we don't usually concentrate on here on Vinyl Ventures. But his traveling around the country with IndyCar as an avid record collector gives him a really interesting perspective on everything in the industry. It's track dude, Michael Young. We're here. It's a it's, uh, great show. It, it's a, it's a, I've been looking forward to this. Uh, we, we actually had a weekend off, and I, I was planning this forever, just making sure that we had. So I told, I called Mr. Penske. I said, could we have that weekend <laughs> off so I could go to the Crossroads show? And also, he said, 
Yes. Also, Roger, can I borrow your wallet? Yes, could I have your wallet? Because there's a lot of vinyl I still need to purchase. So we talked to Michael in our first season, and um, he's kind of the dig deep guest that we had about pressings and, and, and all that different stuff. In the time since you came in and did the show before, um, what has changed from your perspective in the vinyl world? It's interesting, and, and that's a great part about being with IndyCar. I get to travel all across the United States and pick up pressings. What's interesting is there's a lot more vinyl that's actually flooding the market right now, stuff that you didn't think you'd ever see, and just as quickly as you see it, it goes away. So it, it has become one of those instances of if you see something you like, get it now oh. because it probably won't be there next time you come we, around. We preach that all the time is that you're going to regret not buying something more than you're going to regret buying something. So a, great, a great example, this show. And this, is, this was my indicator of having to buy when I wanted to see it. So uh, Ricky Lee Jones... Her, her first record, mm -hmm. there was a MoFi pressing here. One of the is dealers. Is that the one with Ricky's in Love? Chucky's in Love. Chucky's in Love. Sorry. Ricky's in Love with Chucky's in Love with Ricky. Oh, yes. okay. See, I thought Lucy loved Ricky. Well, that's a whole different show. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but they had they had the MoFi pressing, the box set, yeah. and the box was a little beat up, but they weren't asking a lot for it. Yeah. And I thought, eh, I'll get it, and I'm like, eh, nah, I'll, I'll pass on it. Then next, you came back. Came back. Next show, it's here. The next show. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to buy it. Mm -hmm. And I went. They had a money machine out there. But being frugal, I thought, my bank's right across the street. I'll just go across the street. <laughs> so I went across the street, got the money. I'm like, two shows. It's coming home with me. I got back. And in the time it took me to cross the street, it was gone. It's a tale as old as time anymore if I... Well, I haven't had much time to look around today because we've been up here and doing all this stuff. But... Uh, my wife has even said, if you want it, buy it. And when you get the thumbs up from your wife. That's, if, if, if you get the blessing from your wife to buy anything, vinyl related, <laughs> buy take it. advantage of it and buy. Absolutely. Yeah, to so, the, point, the point where you probably shouldn't buy any more, but honey, you said it was okay, so I'm buying. So you travel around the country with IndyCar to all the races. Yep. You get to be in all regions of the country. Yep. What have you seen from a vinyl perspective change like in the last couple of years like other than the you know it's out there you said it just popped up where do you think these records have been in it, people's basements it's odd i think that's a lot of what it is and what i have found and and what i've been on the prowl for is a lot of uk pressings yeah. so i'll travel out and i'll find uk pressings and a lot of times you can just tell by the back of it because they had the flap on the sides like fold, Beatles. like yeah, the fold, over the fold yeah you'll you'll see a lot of you can just feel and tell I found a Yardbirds pressing, oh. Roger the Engineer, and it was pretty beat up, yeah. so I ended up not buying it because yeah. they wanted a premium for it. But I've seen a lot of UK vinyl to the point where, if you got a second, my favorite record store in the country, Bananas Records, down down in St. Petersburg. St. Pete, Tampa. Yep, yep Tampa, St. Pete. Um, I was down there, and I found two UK pressings of 10cc. Um, how Dare You and uh, the, the, the soundtrack. Uh, I forget the name of the soundtrack. The soundtrack, whatever. Doesn't matter. I can't remember the I can't name remember yet. the name of the title. But it doesn't matter. UK pressing. Mm -hmm. Loved it. Great shape. I was so excited. I took them up, bought them, got them back home. How Dare You, the album, was a U.S. vinyl pressing inside oh. the UK jacket. And I'm like, how silly of me not to check to make sure bait and switch mike hey and you know what happened i what? called him i said hey can you check to see if there's a uk pressing in, a, in an american sleeve they found it and they sent it to me and now i have a, the complete uk how dare you and you know it. why they did that michael because they're bananas records well because you're a great you're a great ambassador to the vinyl world well i don't know about that but it was pretty awesome to get the uk pressing and everything so i see a lot of that i see a lot of uk stuff a lot of german stuff and i don't know why it's really i think everything else has been picked through and mm -hmm. people who probably you know fought overseas and were part of our military that bought these yep. albums came back and they're starting to you know just get rid of their vinyl because it's at a premium, I think that's the other thing you're seeing that people are starting to realize the value in the stuff that they have. I think so. You're they're right. dumping it right now, mm -hmm. and there's there's a reinvigoration. I mean, just the amount of kids that are here today, kids, uh, youngsters. And yeah, it's like it's kids great. and women. Yeah, and it's great. It's, it's great, great to see. To see. Um, where do you see it going? Uh, we we've kind of been on this 
since Wheels and I have been doing this show, we've been on this, we've been talking about the wave cresting eventually. And it seems like even within a year, it seems like it's getting to a point, it kind of falls off, record store day happens, it keeps going up. And, you know, everybody I talk to that, that sells records, they don't, there's no end in sight. I think, I, 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 I agree with what you say, that the, the, the wave may be cresting, but what's different now than when I was in radio is that you're not seeing a lot of crap being released that with records for a day right I think people are and then there's some bad releases but I think these labels are very particular in what they're releasing so you're not flooding the market with stuff that no one's ever going to want to buy so and they're doing a lot of limited runs on things yep. so that makes things more desirable and I think that makes part of the thrill of looking through these boxes and looking through records is, oh my gosh, it's it's the, the thrill of the hunt. And if you yeah. can find something, yeah, I found a couple things today that I I want to get Fleetwood Mac mystery to me. That's the one I came here to find and I haven't found it yet. Yeah. Well, I found one copy, but it's not what I wanted. But in any case, <laughs> it's that thrill of the hunt, of finding things. And I think as long as there's vinyl coming back into the system where people are selling stuff and and there are great record stores, and, and that's the other great thing, just great record stores. Yeah. I think that's the one thing that kids are finding is that they can hold something in their hand. It's mm. tangible, that they are able to, this I have. It's, it's I not got, just ones and zeros. Right. It's, it's a real piece I have 10,000, 10,000 records. Uh, who cares? To be able to hold, you know, on your phone, be able to actually hold a piece of vinyl, completely different than 10,000 whatever's on your phone, yeah. right? Yeah. And it's and, and it's it's a multi-sensory oh. thing, too. Too. You smell the mustiness of where the thing's been stored. You know, right. you've got the 12 by 12 piece of art. You've got the inner sleeves. You've got all of that stuff that you can just... It's the commitment of when you listen to vinyl, you take the vinyl out of the jacket. You then put it on the turntable. You clean it. You drop the needle. And you sit because you can't walk away. Right. With digital, you just walk away. And right. if it plays forever, who cares? Yep. You're committed to sit there for 15 to 18 minutes to listen to a side of music. So you're getting the whole experience as opposed to just bouncing through songs digitally. And I is think it, that's the magic of vinyl. I think it is, too. Folks, this is Michael Young. He was one of our early guests on the show. And we can't thank you fun. enough for sitting fun. down and talking to us. Love it. Man, I really think we could have Michael as a guest on every single show. Yeah, I think so, too. And, you know, one of the things that I talked to him, he, he told me how much he loves the 45s and 45. And uh, we may have some guests in the 45 and 45 because he, he I think he'd really be great. Doing, <laughs> he would be. Doing that. Uh, it makes me giggle just thinking yeah. about him doing those. <laughs> well, one of the great things about this show, and it was kind of touch and go toward the end, I wasn't sure that John and I would be able to uh, get out there and dig through the records ourselves because we were interviewing folks and doing what's in your bags, but we did have a chance to go out and buy some stuff. And one of the great things that I got is already up here on our record stand, and this is Desolation Boulevard by Sweet. I, it, the funny thing is, at Record Store Day at Karma, the day before the Crossroads show, I, I picked this up and almost bought it. But it wasn't in as great a shape as, as this copy was. So it, it was meant to be that I found this at the Crossroads show. Yeah, it's a, it's a sweet record. Oh, it is. And it's, it's a must-have. I think it's, this band has been marginalized so much. They, they kind of got some love from the original Wayne's World. If, if you remember, they redid Ballroom Blitz in that movie. I, these guys were so great. And I mean, that's how everybody knows them, Ballroom Blitz, but every single song oh, yeah. is really, really good. Yeah, it's fantastic. We got, it starts with Ballroom Blitz, uh, The Sixteens, No You Don't, ACDC, I Want to Be Committed, Sweet F.A., Fox on the Run. Oh, Fox on the Run. That's the other one I was thinking of. That's a great yeah. song. Set Me Free, Into the Night, and uh, Solid Gold Brass. What a great what a great record. And this thing, literally, I, I took it out. It looks like it's not even been touched. So, it's beautiful. Yeah. Thanks, man. Uh, show us one or two of your favorite things that you got from so, the show. So I ha a band that I've been looking for. But you don't see very often. Comsat Angels. Wow. And 
ComSat Angels were like a post-punk band that just really didn't immediately take off. Mm-hmm. This is a collection from, I think it's a Dutch collection. Is it really? It's like a Greatest Hits collection. Oh, that's cool. I love the colors. Oh, it. yeah, it's gorgeous. It's, uh, here's, the, here's the back of it. These guys are just, uh, you know, dramatically lit, ready to take on the world. Yeah, and they're they're one of those uh, post punk bands that kind of they're like under the radar of post punk, which that's kind of hard to hard to even be. They're like the underground of the underground. That's funny. Do you remember who you got this from? Where did I get? It's this? okay if you don't. Yeah, I can't remember. Exactly. I, I can't remember who I got the sweet record from. <laughs> so, but I do remember who I got my next one. I'm going to talk about from. What do you got? I've been wanting to get. I, I'm not going to be a Slayer completist by any stretch of the imagination, but Shane Hiles always has the best metal records. And he's he's got used ones, but he's also got really great repops. And I was flipping through his, his records, and I saw this, and I'm like, oh, I got to have it. This this is definitely, definitely one that I needed. And this starts with Angel of Death, Piece by Pete's, Piece by Piece, Necrophobic, Altar of Sacrifice, Jesus Saves, Criminally Insane, Reborn, Epidemic, Postmortem, and Raining Blood. I mean, these these guys are one of the big four um, thrash bands. And like I said, I'm, I'm definitely not going to be a completist with these dudes, but this is one that I've wanted for a while. And That's and, a good one. And I don't see it a lot of places, so I, I'm like, sure, add it, add it to the total, man. What, what else did you uh, grab that you want to talk about? Well, the other one I found, and this is another one I've been looking for because I recently saw this uh, documentary on uh, Big Star. And you're oh, like, okay. wait a minute, Big Star, what are you talking about? Big Star's not on this. Alex Chilton, who was one of the big players in Big Star mm-hmm. and the guitarist, plays lead guitar on this. Oh, does he really? And so what Alex did after Big Star failed to really take off, now they're the darlings of the indie industry. Yeah, well, the the big band that never really became big, but yeah. everybody talks about it. But them. they're so influential on tons of 80s bands. Oh, yeah. And uh, so Alex went to uh, New York, went to CBGB's and hung out and then brought a bunch of bands like he had bands like Gun Club and The Cramps and Tav Falco was another one that came to Memphis to record at the studio he hung out at. And there's Alex in his... uh, (laughs) He, he's not billed as Alex Chilton on this. He's billed as, what is it? Uh, Let's see. It says Tav Falco uh, Z Chilton? Yeah. Uh, or uh, Zero Chilton? Yeah, Jesus it's hard. It's Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to take that over to Ohio so you can read it? <laughs> Why can't I fucking... <laughs> I can't fucking read that. I can't either. It's L, is it LT? LT Chilton. Yeah. LT Chilton. That's that's great, man. I right hear Walt. Oh. Because that's a mess. Okay. So right there is Alex, and he's billed as LT Chilton on okay, this. Okay, so under under the radar. Yeah, under the radar. Yeah, that's awesome, man. It, it There is no way that you can go to a show like the crossroads show and not walk away with, with something that you want. Um, I always talk about, and I talked about it at the show with multiple people. I have a list of stuff that I want to pick up that I never have time to grab because I get to a show and I'm immediately like track tractor beamed to something. And I completely forget about that list. It's easy to get, uh, it's like going in the casino and you just see all these machines for us records Yeah, and you're just like, I got to check this out. I got to check. And you, you wind up being like a, the kid on sugar at the first (laughs) County fair. It's crazy. (laughs) It was such a blast to, to approach this show the way that we did. Yeah. And, and we have to give special thanks to Rob. And, and his wife and his son 
and everybody that that puts together the Crossroads show to let us come in and invade that show the way that we did. Um, it was it was really a blast to to do that. But I also want to give special thanks to Keith Timms and Jacob Hansen because those guys gave up their entire Sunday to hang out with us and uh, just hang out at a record show. And I think they had fun too. This is the perfect 50th show for us yes. because it has brought together, it's, it's kind of the culmination of everything that we've done until now, being able to talk to those previous guests and being able to get those guys that we haven't talked to that we've always wanted to. It, it just a perfect storm for us. Absolutely. I mean, I love these shows and I love this show in particular because they're one, there's so many people we know and yeah. it, it's just a, that's what record shows wind up being. They're as much about the product as the people. Yeah. And the community, we've said it a million times, but the community um, around here with, with this record collecting thing has, has just really been great to be a part of. And, you know, we were just two dudes with a crazy idea and we, all of these people have welcomed us with open arms since we've been a part of it as Vinyl Ventures. And we just can't thank all of them enough, too. We also want to thank all of you out there that didn't have a chance to be at the Crossroads show for listening, for liking, for subscribing to our YouTube channel, for laughing at the silly things that we've been doing with our 45 and 45s. Uh, all of these things make a huge difference to us. We, we want to take that community that we have been a part of at Crossroads Music Show and take it to the interwebs and welcome you folks into it. So we need ideas for shows from you guys and more interactivity on social media about all of the things that we're putting out there and doing. But most of all, we just want to thank you guys for listening and supporting us for these four years that we've done the show. So, for Wheels, I'm Jay, and we'll see you all the next time around. It's a final venture.